So let's continue with our uh, special uh, uh, topic lectures on uh, classical differential geometry for physics students. And I want to take a look at spherical and hyperbolic uh, geometries. Okay, we, we studied uh, the, the geometry of a sphere, so I'm not going to emphasize that, except to do a little bit in passing. But then I'll try to uh, make a surface with a Gaussian curvature of minus one Okay, and uh, and see and see what we learn from that. Okay, and then we'll we'll take a look at the at, at the sphere and, and discuss the projective plane. We get an expression for the metric of the uh, of the sphere, which is conformal to the plane. Very uh, uh, useful useful result. And then we'll turn to hyperbolic uh, the geometry. That'll be an exercise in uh, complex analysis, actually. And we'll be looking at the construction of a, of a, of a space with a constant negative uh, uh, curvature, an example of non-Euclidean uh, geometry dating back to Bolyai and Lopuchevsky. Okay, well, so let's, let's remember. Uh, we can make a space with k equals 1, for example, by rotating a semicircle around the z-axis. We studied uh, surfaces of revolution uh, before, and let's just... Uh, think about the sphere in that context. Okay, and, then, and that, that brings up the question, if I can do that and make a, make a space with a positive Gaussian curvature, can I make a space with a negative Gaussian curvature as well? So, well, let's recall the sphere. Here's a, I can start, I can start with a semicircle, okay, here in the x, z axis. So, c of theta. Here's theta, here's the point P, is equal to, in, in the Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z, is equal to, I see in this in particular parameterization with a unit circle, x is sine of theta, y is zero, and, and uh, the z direct, and the, the z height is cosine theta. And I can rotate, rotate this through the, through the angle phi, the z component remains the same, and my, uh, my, my x coordinate gets rotated into sine theta cosine phi, and my and my y uh, coordinate uh, comes from zero, uh, or when the circle is in the x z plane, to sine theta sine phi. When I rotate the point P uh, through an angle, an azimuthal angle of phi, into the y axis. And then I, I know how to uh, do the geometry here. I can, for example, just calculate the the uh, derivatives of r and, and with respect to theta and phi and make my first and second fundamental forms, et cetera, et cetera. I can find the metric. It's just the d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. And I can then confirm that this gives me a surface with a Gaussian curvature of 1. And we know lots of ways now in order to make that argument. Lots of ways. Count them up. Okay, and, and so that's, uh, that's quite handy. I want to remember that this is the metric of a sphere, okay, that I have a d theta squared, okay, then I have a harmonic function squared times d phi, the line element perpendicular to, to theta. Now let's try to make a pseudosphere, okay. So, so a, a, a two-dimensional surface with a negative uh, Gaussian curvature will choose our dimension so that it's minus one. And I don't know how to, how to do this, so I'll, I'll try to take a stab and, uh, and do it with a uh, surface of revolution. So I'll take, a, I'll take a curve C in the x, z plane. I'll label it uh, f of s, 0, g of s, in the same way as we did for the, for the sphere. Okay, and I'll take it to be, uh, have unit velocity. So uh, f prime squared plus d prime squared is equal to 1. s is the arc length, and so that's just the statement that the, that the tangent vector is normalized. Okay, then now I'll just take this fellow who rotated around the, uh, the z-axis. I know how to do that. There's, there's a result. We've done it a million times. And now I can calculate uh, the metric. Um, I, I'm, I'm using uh, the mesh s. And, and, and phi s the uh, the distance of, along the uh, along the curve and phi the the azimuthal angle as usual and so I can calculate 
the derivative of r with respect to s, the derivative of r with respect to phi, uh, like that. Okay. As usual, I'm using primes for differentiation with respect to s. And then I can calculate the metric. So uh, I have the components of the metric to calculate, e, f, and g, perhaps. Okay, e is, is uh, the, mag the magnitude square of r sub s. Here's r, here's r sub s. I can form, I can form its uh, magnitude. I see it's f prime squared plus g prime squared, and that's one. It just, it just recalls that the uh, tangent vector in the, in the plane is normalized appropriately. I can calculate f. That's a dot product of these, these two fellows, and clearly from the picture, they're orthogonal. I confirm that just by taking the dot product. End of story. And then g, I can I take uh, also differentiating the phi direction dotted with itself, and that just as you see here gives me gives me f squared. Okay, so therefore uh, dr squared is ds squared plus f squared d phi squared. Okay, I didn't have to really do all this calculation to get that, but uh, okay, because this is just the arc length in the xz plane, and then this is the arc length uh, perpendicular to it. I can read it off the geometry of the picture. And then I can calculate, for example, the, uh, the Gaussian curvature. Lots of ways to do that. I can do that as a ratio. I can calculate the second fundamental form. I can take the ratio of the, of the uh, determinants. I can go back to the, uh, the Gauss's excellent theorem and, uh, and do it as a, as a problem in these simple differentiations. And it's, I've done calculations like this a, a lot in, in the past. And it's just minus f double prime over f. Okay. So now I can, I'm going to view this then uh, as a differential equation for f. I'm going to ask what is the shape okay, of this curve so that k is minus 1. So I'm turning the problem around a bit and see what, and see what happens. So if k is minus 1, the differential equation for f becomes an exponential growth of decay equation. I'm just writing it out from the previous page. k is minus 1, the coefficient here is minus one, and so this is just the equation for exponential growth or decay. Solution, exponential. Uh, I have to choose boundary conditions. Let's, uh, let's try the case of f of s equals e to the s. Okay, just choose a is equal to one. Normalization doesn't matter. Uh, and let's choose uh, b, to be, b to be zero. Um, I can look at other situations, but I'll learn some things from, from this, okay? You might want to look at uh, maybe a is equal to b, and you know, and, and you know, and so then in that case, f is proportional to the hyperbolic cosine, okay, of uh, of s. And that might be the arithmetic there might be uh, fine. Oh, we'll just do exponentials. So here, here's f. Uh, g is determined just from the condition that, that the change in its unit length. So g prime is the square root of one minus f prime squared. Okay, f. Has to, it is e to the s that satisfies my, my the differential equation, my Gauss's excellent theorem, and then I calculate g of s. That's an integral. I can I can do it, and uh, and here's and here's what I get. It's a famous curve of differential geometry called the tractrix. Okay, but I see also in this that when I when I when I do this, um, it's not it doesn't make sense for all possible values of this parameter s. Parameter s has to be less than or equal to to zero. Otherwise, uh, you see, I'm going to I'm going to get imaginary imaginary parts in here. Okay, here you, you see you see right over here one minus e to the e to the minus e, e to the mi minus s. I, I if uh, if the s range is not restricted, I'm going to get the uh, square roots of uh, the square root here of a negative number, and I want my solution to be real, okay? Well, maybe it's a little bit more uh, a visual if I switch to x, y, z notation. So x is f, z is g of s, okay? And so, uh, and so let's, uh, let's write it in, in, in Cartesian form, okay? So I have to remember, to do that, I have to remember an identity, the inverse hyperbolic cosh of a variable is a log of the variable plus the square root of the variable squared minus one. I identify, I think of this because here it is, 
So the equation for g of s can be written as, I'm taking z as, as, as g of s, that's certainly the way I set up my curve to be rotated. z is square root of 1 minus x squared minus inverse cosh of 1 over 1 over x. Okay, and, 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 and so I, I, I see, for example, that the magnitude of, of x has to be uh, uh, has to be less than or equal to one. Okay, here's here's the profile. When it's rotated, I get a I get a curve that looks like a horn. Okay, so so just plot it. Use your Mathematica or or uh, <coughs> or whatever whatever uh, bit of software you like. Okay, uh, a geometry graphing uh, a software. And, uh, and make a plot of, uh, uh, of this uh, surface. The surface is called a pseudosphere. It's called a pseudosphere because yes, it has k is equal to minus one. That's how it's constructed. Okay, the, the range of x is between zero, okay, and, uh, and less than and equal to one. A problem with it, with it is, that is, is the restriction that I learned that, that uh, x has to be, has to be held uh, less than or equal to one, it has a sharp edge at x is equal to one. So in fact, the surface is not complete. Okay, I'm solving the differential equation here, but there's an edge, if I go to the edge, it's still defined. Curious properties uh, about this, about this uh, pseudosphere is that, is that it's a surface of infinite extent, as you see, okay? It's a horn that, that, that starts at z is equal to zero, and goes to z of, uh, up in infinity, but it shrinks rapidly as I go, as I increase in, uh, in, in z, and it's so in fact, uh, you can show, just do, just do an integral, that the surface has, a, has an infinite extent but a finite volume, and the finite volume is pi over 3, and it has a finite surface area, 2 pi. Okay? 2 pi, yes. It looks like it, it's, a, it's sort of an inverted hemisphere. Okay, it has a surface area of a, of, of, of a hemisphere, but it's in some sense inside out. There's k of minus one, okay? And, uh, and I'm unable to uh, evade uh, a, a singular edge uh, over here. Maybe I put a pseudosphere on the other side and, and, have, a, <coughs> and, and have it uh, have a neck down here, but it, I can't avoid the fact that there's, an, that there's an edge and I can't make a complete surface. Well, that might just be because I, I, I didn't make the optimal choice here, or that I'm just restricting myself to surfaces of revolution. In fact, there's a famous theorem of, uh, of Hilbert that says that you, you cannot uh, embed a, a surface of constant negative curvature into three-dimensional Euclidean space in a complete and regular fashion. So I'm illustrating a theorem that's uh, considerably deeper than my little exercise little exercise here. Uh, go to the textbook, Manfredo's textbook, and you'll have a discussion of, of Hilbert's theorem, a very famous uh, theorem of, uh, of classical differential geometry. And uh, David Hilbert, uh, famous name in mathematics and physics. You might know that he was the, uh, he was the mathematician that in some sense competed with Einstein for the fundamental formulation of general relativity. And uh, general relativity can be can be uh, formulated as a, as a field theory starting with a Lagrangian density. Lagrangian density is 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 just the Ricci scalar, and that was a, and that was what uh, Hilbert contributed to the uh, uh, to the field. Okay, uh, as a fundamental way of generating general relativity, the a theory of space of, of gravitation that's compatible with special relativity. Okay, uh, so so that, that was a fun that was a fun exercise. I, I recommend uh, go to go to Wikipedia. You'll find some pretty pictures of, of this, and you'll find uh, pictures of other uh, related uh, uh, surfaces that are illustrated of this. Okay, well let's take another look at spherical geometry. The the point about about this is that I I want to look at spherical geometry and look at a different way of parametrizing the surface the surface of the sphere to uh, to illustrate a couple of other 
aspects of differential geometry, in particular conformal maps. I'm going to write the uh, well the the projective uh, approach to the uh, to this uh, to the uh, upper half sphere. Okay, gives me a metric which is of that of that character. Okay, a stereographic projection is a very famous thing in the in the history of map making and, and mathematics. So here, how am I going? To, how uh, how will I choose to parameterize points on the upper half sphere? Well, I might take the point the North Pole and just project a line down to the. A, a, a flat surface that goes through the equator, and I'll call those points U and V. Okay, so each point P on S squared can be labeled with X, X1, X2, X3 in our usual polar coordinate system, okay, with the constraint, okay, that the sphere has a unit radius. And now I want to I parameterize and take a look at, at this, at the image of the, uh, of the sphere under this stereographic projection. In other words, I'm going to make a flat map of the of the uh, of North America, okay, and uh, the Northern Hemisphere. I'm going to use complex notation just because I want to set up some work we're going to do in hyperbolic geometry. I don't need complex notation. I'm just going to use it as an abbreviation to to couples U V. I can just use I can just use conventional notation for uh, the variables that parameterize a a. Uh, a flat surface, but let's let's use complex variables. Think of it as u plus i y, u plus i v, and uh, and such. Okay, and so and so uh, we, we want to be able to calculate the point uh, u v from the point p on, on on the surface, and I just draw this line and uh, and draw the geometry of that line. So here's the here's the z axis going from the origin to the north pole. Okay, and here's my point x1, x2, and uh, and x3. Okay, I'm projecting projecting that point P onto the z-axis. It's up at a height x3, of course. Okay, this radius is one, so this distance is one minus x3. Okay, and here's the point uh, uh, uv. Okay, so then I can just read off of of this picture the. From, from proportional triangles, that, that z equals u plus i v. I'm just using uh, I'm, I'm just using complex analysis to, to treat the x and y axes, which I'm calling u and v. And and I see what that is. Okay, so uh, <coughs> so so u plus u plus u plus i i v is is proportional to x one plus i x two. Okay. This, this triangle here, you see, okay, it's proportional, it's proportional to this one, okay, this triangle being u plus iv, that's this point, it's proportional to this one, that's x1, x1 plus i, x2, divided by 1 minus x3, right? On the, on the left hand side I have a u plus i v divided by this length, and this length is one, so I don't write it there. No, and over here I have this triangle, and I write out its dimensions. So that then tells me how to how to map from from uh, the surface of the sphere to the surface of of the plane, and I have to remember that x one, x two, and x three are constrained. So just just do that. Just do the arithmetic, and I, I, and I leave it to a recitation section. Just to do it, there's nothing really tricky about it. I just want to solve now for x1, x2, and x3 in terms of u and v, and I find that x1 is 2u over 1 plus u squared plus v squared, and similarly for x2, and similarly for x3. It's just a little bit of, uh, uh, of solving this, uh, setting up this, this proportion, remembering the constraint, and going at it. Just, just do it. Okay. So, so, so yep, there you go. So now I can write r. The position on the on on the upper half plane, uh, on the upper half hemisphere, okay, in, in terms of u and v, and here it is. I'm just writing out x1, x2, and x3, and then I can take the various derivatives like that. Everything is straightforward as soon as I done my proportionality. Okay.
then I can calculate my metric, okay? I can calculate E, it's four over this quantity squared. I can calculate F, it's nice and zero. And I can calculate G as this square, and it's four over quantity one plus U squared plus B squared, all squared. Okay, and so therefore the metric in this parameterization has this, has this conformal uh, uh, a form. It's flat space, okay, modulated by an overall scale, which varies as, as you move from uh, over, over U and V. Okay, I can write it in terms of a complex notation, okay? So I can write du squared plus db squared as dz times dz bar, where z is just u plus iv. And I can write the denominator down here, u squared plus v squared as zz bar, okay? So I can use complex notation for it, like that. I want to do that because it's going to inspire me to, uh, when I move from k equals one, spherical space to hyperbolic space. And I also remember that this is just the good old sphere, uh, and I know the metric of the sphere. So I learned a few things. I learned that the sphere is conformal to the plane. Okay, and here's the mapping that gets me from one to the other. I have a stereographic projection. It's conformal, okay? So, so it preserves angles. It, it's, it's, it's pretty clear that a metric, a metric like this has a scale factor the same in the x direction and the y direction, and so it preserves angles, but not lengths or areas. It's a stereographic projection. It's not an isometry. Okay. Easy to check that k is equal to one in these variables. Okay. Just plug it into the Gauss's uh, excellent theorem, and you and you've got it. Okay. Or you can, or well, you can do it many many different ways. This could be good. Or do it in a number of different ways. Remember that's a stereographic projection. Okay. So for uh, u and v in 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 the vicinity of, 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 uh, of one, okay? It's, uh, it does, it has not much uh, distortion, okay? But when, uh, okay, but uh, when you and V are large, then there's a lot of distortion, and that's just clear from the, from the, from the picture, from the picture, I'm, I'm projecting off the North Pole, and so for points that are near the North Pole, I project them out here, they go to large U and V, and they're distorted enormously, okay? And they're, and they're expanded relative to those points, P if it's near the equator, okay? And they come down here, the, uh, the expansion, the, the conformal scaling factor is, is not so, uh, it is close to one, and so I, I don't have much distortion. And we all know that's how uh, stereographic maps, uh, maps are, okay? They make, they make Greenland look enormous. Okay, uh, for example, okay, right. And, and you see the conformal scale factor. It's four divided by one plus u squared plus v squared all squared. If u and v are close to one, right, then this is approximately one, okay? So not much distortion there. And then a great amplitude, a, a great distortion uh, if, you're, uh, uh, if you're taking a point near the North Pole. Okay, well that's all we wanted, we wanted to do uh, here. It's a nice illustration of, a, of a conformal, conformal variables. They're very useful in two-dimensional field theories, uh, string theory, map making. They show up uh, ev everywhere, and so I think it's nice to see it. Next time we'll turn to the case of uh, hyperbolic uh, geometry and study the Poincaré uh, disk model of, of non-Euclidean geometry.